Well, uh, everybody, good morning. This is a pretty exciting time for Venus. You've been reading about it in the newspapers. Uh, it's usually not so high in public awareness, but it's really risen owing to the resources now being devoted by NASA and the European Space Agency to three medium-sized planetary missions uh, that have approved to uh, study its surface, but remotely, uh, the atmosphere directly, uh, but the uh, synthetic aperture radar uh, is a, a more of a, a traditional remote method. So when we were organizing this uh, workshop on sample capture uh, and maybe return or at least analysis, we'll find out what works. Uh, we don't really know. Uh, we were aware that these three, uh, 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 these um, uh, discovery class missions would be announced, the results uh, in this last week. And I remember Noam was uh, quite convinced that uh, if none of them were approved, everybody here would be really disappointed and grumbly and depressed. And he said that, well, if one of them were selected, everybody would be jubilant. Now, two of them are selected. So this is really uh, uh, more than being jubilant. Even the grumpiest of us ought to be pretty happy about that. Um, so. I expect that what's going to happen is that now these uh, Discovery class missions, uh, Da Vinci plus uh, Veritas and uh, the Envision project uh, from uh, the European Space Agency, will make it even more compelling for looking at the uh, composition and, and morphology of what's on the surface of, of Venus, where direct measurements that way, or offer a long-lived aerial platform for longer studies or, or both. Uh, so I think it's a really uh, interesting time to have this, uh, uh, this workshop. The timing uh, really couldn't have worked out better. Uh, you'll hear for from Valerie Scott uh, uh, soon uh, Wednesday uh, on what the goals and processes are for the workshop. Uh, basically though, we're here to brainstorm some ideas, see what we can come up with. Um, uh, and really this requires a pretty diverse range of talent as Michelle had just mentioned. Uh, we have uh, people who are not experts in Venus, but they're experts in robotics or sensors, uh, uh, high temperature materials and so on. And, uh, we kind of need this range so that we don't uh, violate physical laws. That would be uh, something to avoid. Or we uh, demand a technology that's just unobtainable in the near future. Uh, so we really need a lot of uh, thinking about this because the uh, surface of Venus is hot. I mean, it's 460 degrees Celsius, uh, 733 Kelvin. If you like Fahrenheit, it's 860 Fahrenheit. And if you like this Rankine scale, it's even higher, 1,320 degrees Rankine. So anyway, uh, today is the uh, short course uh, to tell us uh, some more about what we know about the surface and atmosphere of Venus and to introduce some of the technologies for possible mission concepts and further exploration. So without further ado, I'll uh, uh, introduce our uh, first instructor, who's also a co-organizer of this workshop, uh, Noam Eisenberg. Uh, he earned his PhD in uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences some 25 years ago from Washington University, did a postdoc at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, uh, where he still is as a, a principal professional staff member. Uh, so Noam is interested in uh, remote sensing and in-situ measurements of the rocky planets in general and their surface uh, composition, morphology, and the geologic processes within them. Uh, and this includes Venus. And he'll tell us uh, um, some of what we know about Venus, uh, which um, we'll, we'll uh, uh, see. There's more that could be done, right, Noam? Just unmuting myself. And yes, that's, that's absolutely right. And... Uh... Um, I'm really, really happy and proud to be here today. I mean, extraordinarily happy to be here today in these circumstances. Um, should I, I should share my screen just to start out with and um, uh, because to introduce what my talk is going to be. So hang on just one second, let me do that. Hopefully this will go smoothly sharing and then doing this thing so that we can see the whole thing. Is that is that, that looks visible? Great. Yeah, it looks great now. All right. So, um, and, you know, so interestingly enough, right, my talk has actually, I had to restart it a couple of times. I had to rewrite it a couple of times over the last two weeks uh, because the def, you know, you'll see the definition of unobtainable has actually changed in the last two weeks. Um, 
And but before, and I know most of the people here are have some uh, interest and uh, and knowledge of Venus science and stuff like that already. But I kind of wanted to begin with a tiny story about why we want to explore Venus the way we do. And this is a credit to Stephen Kane, one of the um, a Venus slash exoplanet scientists who really has gotten into the the importance of Venus for understanding rocky planets uh, in the context of our solar system and other solar systems. So imagine for a moment that you live in a small town, right? It's a beautiful place. You, you love living there. The town is full of life. It's got everything you need. The nearest town is the same size and it seems like it was once maybe identical, but now it's, a, it's burned to the ground with no sign of life. It's like, it's a stark reminder of mortality. You ask others, uh, what happened to that other town and nobody in your town knows. You ask how long ago it happened, again, nobody knows. You ask uh, if uh, we don't know when or how it happened, then could the same thing happen to our town? And again, no, no answer. Uh, so it, you know, think about that if, if, would you want to know, would you feel comfortable not knowing what happened to that town if you could actually go there and figure it out? Uh, and this is one of the reasons why uh, the analogy is 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 interesting, and it begins to break down because it's a lot easier to drive to the town next door. It's a lot harder to get to the surface of Venus and and study it. But uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So um, so this introductory uh, talk of the short course uh, is going to be about unobtainable Venus science. And let me see if I can successfully advance the slides. That will work. Um, and we're going to answer sort of, we're going to address in this talk about five uh, questions. Um, what are the big science questions remaining for Venus? What is considered a feasible architecture um, uh, by VEXAC, the Venus Exploration Analysis Group, which is sort of a broad community inter uh, interest uh, analysis advocacy group uh, for the Venus community to NASA and to the uh, um, planetary science community in general. Um, which of the questions that are not directly addressed by current feasible architectures, and we'll talk about that in, a, uh, in more detail later, uh, what questions that are not called out in uh, by the community so far represented by VEXAG uh, that we would be asking if we thought we could do them, and what are the uh, atmospheric, temperature, environmental conditions that can be challenging or beneficial to uh, returning to the upper atmosphere of Venus uh, in the way that this workshop is, is thinking of doing. So um, to begin with, you know, so what are, the, so the first question, what are the big science questions remaining for Venus informed by what is actually obtainable Venus science? So um, as we were alluding to earlier, the definition of obtainable <clears throat> and what remaining science uh, um, exists has actually changed radically in the last two weeks. Um, so we're gonna start by investigating the Venus science goals, objectives, and investigations that the community has been refining for the last you know, 20 plus years since the end of the Magellan era and into the uh, to the European Venus Express and, uh, and uh, uh, Japanese JAXA's Akatsuki mission. Um, and what uh, of these, what of these uh, goals and objectives and investigations are feasible today? Um, and what is obtainable? But, you know, again, the, 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 what is so all of these things will we will see may be considered feasible but the question about whether they were obtainable or not was only recently answered in a more definitive way so i'm going to begin uh with the basic the fundamental goals and objectives so uh the way vexag the way the community broke down you know or some summarized the big science questions for Venus is we had three main goals, each of which had two objectives, and each of those objectives had a series of investigations that would help answer that. So the first goal for uh, trying to understand Venus is to understand Venus's early evolution uh, and the potential habitability of the planet to constrain the evolution of Venus-sized planets like Earth and exoplanets like we're discovering uh, in other solar systems. The objectives, the subcategories of that goal, did Venus have temperate surface conditions more like the Earth uh, and liquid water at early times, and if so, for how long? And, and also, uh, concurrently, how does Venus elucidate possible pathways for planetary evolution in general? Is Venus the once and future Earth? 
is it some is it did we diverge in some way that we will that we don't expect to uh, to meet at some point in the future and so and the way you know we want to get at these objectives is we have a series of investigations um, so for example and I'm, I'm gonna go through these just really quickly um, the the investigations of whether uh, Venus shows evidence for uh, for crustal material that formed in the presence of water or not the search for evidence of crustal recycling on Venus. Uh, how, uh, how has Venus, how did Venus lose its water if it had oceans worth? Uh, and, and is it, what are the processes of, of its atmosphere being lost now? Um, does it have any remnant magnetism from a period where it might've had a dynamo? Um, it, it, Venus does not have, we haven't measured a magnetic field today, but that doesn't mean there may not be small patches of remnant magnetism if we can get really close up with really sensitive instruments. Um, for pathways for planetary evolution, um, we want to measure, for example, the isotopic ratios of the atmosphere and, uh, and determine the, again, where the, where the atmosphere came from um, uh, and it, the, the evolution of the planetary atmosphere. Determine uh, whether, uh, how, you know, how the stress of and, and, uh, and, um, and geodynamics of the planet has changed over time. Um, how does the planet lose its heat into this extraordinarily hot atmosphere? Um, what is the size of Venus's core? Um, you know, and most any substructural, subsurface uh, detailed structure. Um, the second major uh, uh, question is, uh, is to understand, second major goal is to understand the atmospheric dynamics and composition on Venus. Uh, and uh, the the, ob the objectives within there. What processes drive the global atmospheric dynamics on Venus? What is the heat engine? What is the uh, what are the what are the geodynamic pro uh, atmosphere dynamic processes? What processes determine the baseline variations in the Venus atmosphere composition uh, and sort of the global radiative balance? And so again, that's broken into se series of investigations that you know that suggest missions, that suggest instruments, that suggest uh, um, uh, 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 spacecraft. Um, so the, there's a whole series of dynamics of the atmosphere questions. If you can get into the atmosphere or above the atmosphere with the right instruments that talk about the dynamics of the high, the upper atmosphere, the middle atmosphere, um, the role of uh, redistribution of energy of the, uh, around, uh, around the planet. Um, and when we get down to the near surface environment, uh, can we characterize the radiative balance? How does how does uh, energy come in and come out? Uh, uh, that and what drives these big atmospheric uh, differences? The the super rotation uh, of, of the equatorial atmosphere, um, the uh, the interactions the, of, of physical, chemical, potentially even biological interactions from the Venus from Venus's past uh, to to its present. The role of aerosols and uh, and uh, particulates and 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 droplets of of liquid, for example, the uh, uh, sulfuric acid droplets of the majority of the Venus clouds. Um, to understand the unknown ultraviolet absorber of the planet, um, which is this sort of mysterious material which uh, absorbs light at a at a series of ultraviolet wavelengths that we really don't quite understand spectrally because we haven't been there to to analyze the gases in detail or the or the materials in detail. Um, what is um, maintaining or changing or uh, uh, um, or affecting the atmosphere in terms of planetary activity, outgassing? Do we have active volcanism on the surface of, of the of the planet that is that is contributing to changes or maintenance or processes in the atmosphere? And the uh, third goal is to understand uh, uh, geolog the uh, geologic history. Um, uh, preserved on the surface of Venus and the present day couplings between the surface and the atmosphere. So we talked a little bit about that already with volcanism, but so what geologic processes have shaped the surface uh, of Venus and how do the atmosphere uh, and surface of Venus interact? So these are the big basic geologic questions we, we ask of the earth as well. What is the geologic history of Venus? Uh, what is the geochemistry? Uh, what is the sort of elemental composition variation of the surface, the mineralogy, the rock types at different locations of the planet? What is, is Venus currently active? It's about the same size as the Earth, uh, and it has, it's made up of, it's about the same place in the solar system as the Earth, 
And we know Earth is very active. So, it, but we don't yet have really, uh, uh, we have some good circumstantial evidence, but we haven't witnessed geologic activity on Venus yet because we haven't been there for long enough and, and looked at it the right way. Um, the structure of the crust on Venus in three dimensions, we don't understand that. We, don't, we haven't had that kind of ability to look yet. And finally, uh, the questions of uh, local weathering. How does the atmosphere, once something, if you have a new material emerging on, like from an eruption or something like that on the surface of the planet, how does it change over time in, in, in relationship to the atmosphere? Um, local weathering is, you know, what's happening on the sort of outcrop or rock scale globally. Do they do, do we have different patterns or different uh, uh, regimes across the planet? Uh, and so, and that that also, you know, is a um, uh, um, uh, another aspect of chemical uh, interactions, gas solid chemistry with the surface. Um, so, key locations uh, globally, we have different elevation levels. We have uh, uh, we have different. Uh, provinces, tectonic provinces, volcanic provinces, impact craters, big plains units. And we, we, know, only, we know relatively little about many of them. We have our big picture of, of the planet from global radar, for example, from Magellan. We have, uh, we have big picture stuff from the atmospheric missions. Um, but we have so many of these. These are all questions that uh, include that information and that we need uh, more about. And so um, the, the definition of what is actually obtainable about, uh, in terms of these answers has now been sort of rewritten just in the last couple of weeks. Um, so we, so uh, we are about to, in the next decade and a half or so, obtain quite a few pieces of these, uh, these puzzles uh, with the, uh, the, I'll call it Venus triad or Venus triplet because uh, pronouncing the, my little hashtag V3 and US is very difficult. So, but Veritas, Da Vinci, and Envision, two discovery missions from NASA, one uh, cosmic vision mission from, uh, from European Space Agency are coming in the latter half of the, this decade and the early half of the next decade. And they're going to answer, they're going to address many of these goals, objectives, and investigations. And I'm going to sort of recapitulate this a little bit. Um, and You'll see, I'm gonna skip through this a little bit more quickly, but um, uh, the three missions and a little bit from Akatsuki, the, the Japanese mission which is currently in orbit around Venus doing atmospheric science uh, um, uh, are going to, uh, are addressing and will be addressing substantially or partially, or at least a little bit, many of these questions. But many of these questions, even in answering some of these investigations and uh, partially answering some of these objectives, Many questions will remain, many critical aspects of them will remain, and some of them really need the kind of thing that our workshop is going to be targeting. So, for example, uh, so now this is sort of the same table, but I've added two more columns. Uh, we have the goal, objective, investigation, and then what's going to be achieved by these three new missions, and then what future achievements are still going to be waiting in the wings. Um, and I've bolded uh, things that uh, topics that are sort of more specifically addressable by our concept of an in situ laboratory uh, in the atmosphere with the ability to gather samples from the from the surface. So, for example, um, under the first goal, understanding Venus's early evolution and habitability, we are going to be getting uh, infrared uh, emissivity maps and searching for widespread uh, felsic crust or signs that there were. Uh, uh, you know, that, that there were materials that were uh, emplaced onto the surface in the presence of water. Um, we're going to get more, much more detailed radar maps and subsurface sounding from the new radar missions, Veritas and, and, uh, and Envision. And these, these IR maps, which will be coming also from the orbital missions. Um, we're going to get the isotopes of the atmosphere comprehensively from the Da Vinci mission. Um, we're going to be, uh, we're going to get lithosphere, uh, sort of lithospheric thickness information more uh, uh, comprehensively addressed by Veritas and, and, uh, and Envision SAR and gravity data. We're going to get more impression of what is underneath and the thickness of, these, of the crust. Um, we're going to get more constraints on the heat flow, although not direct measurement of it. Uh, we're going to get uh, um, constraints on gravity from more orbital uh, 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 missions. But 
that far column, we have so they're going to leave so many really important questions for us still to answer. The measurement of surface rock composition in C2, particularly in the mountainous Tessery region, um, the the um, uh, in you know in not just you know, so in multiple locations, uh, the really sort of fine scale regional or local scale possibility of remnant magnetic fields. Um, which you kind of need from either close orbit or from balloon or from actual like near surface investigations. Um, the uh, to 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 we can get we'll be able to get even finer detail of atmospheric constituents and and timing from uh, next generation longer lived, uh, for example, mass mass spectroscopy instruments in the Venus atmosphere that can spend time there and sample multiple things. Um, the, the idea of doing uh, seismometry either from the ground or potentially from, uh, from airborne platforms using infrasound, which I think Jim Cutts might talk a little bit about, um, is also something that we might be able to do with our upcoming uh, platforms. So, um, so that's, you know, that's question one. Question two, this is much more of the, the atmospheric regime. And it leaves a lot of, I mean, because the three missions, we have a descent probe through the atmosphere and we have two orbital missions, they touch on many of the atmospheric problems, but don't go deep into things like the atmospheric dynamics. So things like cloud level 3D winds uh, and waves that we would need aerobots for or long lived platforms for the ability to move within the atmosphere. Um, those are, those are uh, future candidates for, for investigations. Um, the idea of how the uh, how energy is transferred between the different levels of the atmosphere. Uh, again, we get you know, one great profile, we get views to different depths from orbit, but being in there and, uh, and for figuring out the cloud level flux uh, going up and down uh, um, is something that you know, uh, in situ matters. Um, and so again, so many of these things, aerosols, the unknown absorber, again, these are things we can get pieces of with the, uh, with the upcoming missions, but to live there and really spend some time and ingest and investigate, that's gonna take a laboratory. Um, and as well, outgassing will probably get really good answers from these orbital missions as to whether or not Venus is currently active, for example. Um, but again, in situ uh, surface and cloud materials and searching for signatures of outgassed volatiles potentially over time uh, to watch this happen um, and to sniff it happening um, are things that a new platform might be able to, to do for us. And finally, uh, for the geologic history, again, this is going, we're gonna get big chunks of this answered uh, in ways that, that we've never, you know, that we've dreamt of for the last 25 years, but haven't really had the chance to do, um, but we're still going to need in situ measurement of surface composition in multiple locations to really understand the, the depth and true history and variety of, of things that have happened to Venus. Um, so the, the, uh, the recurring theme and future achievements in this goal uh, are the measurement of surface materials at different locations, multiple locations, the surface atmosphere interaction at these locations. Um, and, uh, um, and again, you can do that by landing multiple places, or you can do that by grabbing pieces from here and there and looking at them at your leisure. So, um, so thinking about what we are doing now, it's really, it's just the last two weeks have just, you know, I've, I've been floored and ecstatic this entire time, but I'm still looking forward to the next thing, right? We have what's the next generation of Venus exploration going to do? So we have, questions from all levels of the atmosphere. We have um, the ionosphere and escape of atmosphere. We have atmospheric remote sensing orbiters. We have next generation geophysics orbiters. We have for ultra high resolution radar, for example. Uh, we have cloud level aerobots, which is one of the fo focuses of our workshop, um, including aerial laboratories. We have landers. We have you know, really sophisticated landers to get at surface composition. But these things can only last maybe an hour or two on the surface, or maybe a few more by uh, by our current with our current technology. And we also have simpler but long-lived surface stations, which might be able to get us seismology, might be able to get us weather over long periods of time. And you know, and then part of the question: sample retrieval fits into this category. If we can grab things from lander sites, 
potentially bring them to an aerial laboratory that can last for a much longer time than some of these more sophisticated uh, um, landers can do. What does that get us? Is that is there is there room for sample retrieval uh, in this next generation? I think the answer should probably be yes. Um, so the next question then, you know, what is considered feasible uh, a feasible architecture by by Vexag currently? Um, so yeah, so and the the basic answer is all of these elements were considered feasible to go into the to the GOI to the goals to the goal statement. Um, at least technically, and at least at one level or another. Again, you know, it's going to the, even getting these missions that we have are going to leave things for the future because some of the things are at the very edge of our technical capability now. Um, but the GOI was was designed to, to look into the next ten years, maybe the next fifteen. Um, and some of the more detailed stuff, the next steps require technical advances for complete answers. And, uh, and Jim and uh, Gary are going to be talking about our current state of the art and what's coming, those, those capabilities coming up in the next, next couple of talks, um, uh, as, as well as you know, sample, sample uh, uh, retrieval, sample obtaining. Um, uh, and so the, so the question also is, you know, what, what is feasible, not just technically, but programmatically, what is the readiness of not just our, our uh, technical capability, but our, uh, our, the complexity of our uh, people to handle or to, to fund or to, to send? So this is what, uh, these questions are what uh, led us from the goals document to our roadmap and technology plan. So I'm just gonna very, very quickly show you one of the sort of key, uh, uh, a couple of the key plots from the, uh, or, or images from, the, from our roadmap. And this was, you know, this was this was finalized uh, or or put together in 2019 as an update of our previous uh, Venus roadmap. And we were talking about near-term Venus exploration, the possibilities. All of these things were things that could be competed right now for or or, or directed right now from NASA based on the techno techniques we, technologies we had available. And these things might look a little familiar because we've got them. Um, we have, an, we have orbiters going to the surface to study the surface interior, Veritas and Envision. We have um, a current generation uh, atmospheric orbiter in Akatsuki, uh, and, but you know, next generation stuff is, is, it still has all these questions. And now we have an atmospheric entry probe in, in, in the form of Da Vinci. So all of these near-term uh, uh, goals of the roadmap um, are, you know, we've, we've gotten off the starting block. Um, and so then the question is, as we push to the right, as we look into the midterm, into the coming decade, as we look into the far term, the next decade, um, you know, what questions are not directly addressed with feasible architecture? So what is not feasible? Feasible means maybe not technical yet, or maybe not ready as far as complexity is concerned, or maybe not ready as far as, uh, um, as uh, 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 like uh, um, uh, policy or, uh, or um, or you know, uh, I just I just lost the word. Um, but uh, yeah, but uh, but are, are we are we ready as a community to do it yet? Uh, and some of these questions are, um, are they, these are all in the goals document. But they're, they're again they're the they're at the very edge of what we can do and what the next steps are what we want to do. So for example, in situ heat flow requires potentially drilling below one meter so we can get to real bedrock, uh, and in multiple locations so we can understand so we don't so we make sure that we know what's going on in a global sense. Definitive surface, surface elemental mineral composition, again, not just in one's place. You know, you don't study Earth or Mars by going to just one place. Um, global internal structure, like the deep structure uh, stuff, and we're gonna, we're gonna get the crust, we're gonna get pieces of, you know, sort of the idea of the lithosphere, but the core, the mantle, these are questions that we just can't really do well from orbit. Um, uh, volcanic rates, we might be able to determine uh, that Venus is volcanically active in the current, in the, with the current fleet, the current armada going to, going to Venus. But, um, but in order to determine the rates of these things, we need monitoring networks. We need more time watching this. Um, and again, diurnal or annual patterns of the deep atmosphere and the surface. You know, what changes on the surface, if anything, between night and day? Uh, on on Venus, um, how does what are the surface winds like on the uh, uh, in different places across the planet? You know the transportation of sediments or dust, uh, dunes, migration, all that kind of stuff. So these are all 
not directly uh, uh, accessed with what we are doing right now, but you know they're coming. They're, the ability to do them and the need for them is coming as the next step. So looking looking in the future, all of these things that I mentioned, they kind of live here in the mid to far term. Long lived surface platforms can accumulate this kind of diurnal potential um, or you know monitorings uh, of the atmosphere or of the of the surface. Uh, the long lived uh, seismic stations can listen to the heartbeat of the planet and feed and and hear how active it is. Um, uh, the surface uh, an aerial platform that can spend a lot of time or go multiple places or multiple platforms can really investigate the dynamics and composition and variation within the atmosphere over time. So those are the next generations. And one way, sort of the, the first next step that we are, you know, that we can think of um, is something like the Venus flagship. Uh, this was a mission study that was done as part of the pre-decadal work. Uh, Marty Gilmore and uh, um, uh, Pat uh, uh, Beecham led it, and uh, I strongly the the, the it's um, uh, the report is is public, and I strongly encourage everybody interested in this kind of uh, in Venus exploration to take a look at uh, the flagship mission study because it it really does talk about the next steps uh, of Venus exploration. Imagine you know, having Da Vinci and Veritas and Envision's foundation upon which to go to the next level. This is the next level. Um, but even so, we have several questions in, the, in our uh, goals document, in our, in, our, uh, in our objectives that really are not called out because we really aren't ready for them yet. This is the long-term stuff. Um, and it's long term because, again, it's not just that we're technically not quite ready for it, but they're ultra hard to do right now. Um, and one is, um, I'll sort of go, go in order, the deep structure. Again, you know, getting, uh, uh, you know, the earth deep inside is it's heterogeneous. We've got all kinds of stuff going on inside the earth, mantle plumes, varying depths of size of different seismic velocity. This is the kind of stuff that you need sort of long lived seismic interior investigations, you know, arrays of seismometers that can last a long time, listen to the vibrations of the planet and help build this internal map, something that yeah, is really, really ambitious to do. Um, we also need, you know, one of the fundamental questions, what is the absolute age of any material on the Venus surface? We have, I'll show you in a little bit, we have a couple of clues about the relative ages of different things are on the surface. Like this came before that, we've got stratigraphy. But what is the absolute age of the tesseran materials? What is the absolute age of some of these volcanic planes or these younger volcanics? We don't have any of that for Venus. Uh, and and some of the, you know, these, are, these are things that uh, are attainable on Earth for Earth with you know, laboratory techniques. Uh, and there's potential for things like that in sort of some of the new sophisticated uh, um, LIBS or laser-induced uh, uh, breakdown spectroscopy or other uh, uh, types of uh, instrumentation that we might be able to get snapshots for Venus, but a real sort of age dating laboratory for Venus where you can grab pieces of the surface and actually do uh, um, accurate uh, absolute aging of the uh, uh, dating of the surface is would be a game changer. It would be a fundamental, it would give us fundamental information that we just don't know and can't know otherwise. Um, and finally, global compositional variety. Uh, again, we, we touched on this uh, as well, but you know, how do we get many locations feasibly? And by feasibly here is like within reasonable amount of time, reasonable amount of expense, reasonable amount of complexity. So these are questions of things like autonomy. You know, how do we select a site? How do we get to all these sites, roving or 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 selection? And how do we retrieve them? You know, assuming it's extremely hard to send. 15 laboratories or 100 laboratories to one spot, is it easier to grab 15 locations and bring them all to one place? Uh, that's, so, so this is something that, this approach, this architecture is something that is not really addressed in the current uh, uh, um, way of thinking. Uh, and, uh, but it's, it is the, the problem, one of the problems that we are going to be talking about uh, in the coming weeks. So, I'll take the last few minutes to just sort of very, very quickly review you know, what are the atmospheric and temperature and environmental conditions that can be challenges and benefits to returning 
uh, to the upper atmosphere and also returning you know samples to the upper atmosphere and so you know i just we, we've gone through the litany of the really difficult stuff really quickly there's this high temperature high pressure uh surface shrouded by sulfuric acid clouds it's venus is you know venus is hell venus is hard to get to it's hard to survive in um, when you get below this this upper uh, atmospheric level um, uh, and again you, and Venus has multiple it's complex it has multiple layers of clouds and haze and the clouds are primarily you know sulfuric acid droplets uh, and as you get below them uh, you get you know it just very quickly hotter and higher pressure and the and the you know the the atmosphere is dominated by carbon dioxide it's got a little bit of nitrogen. It's got traces of other stuff, including sulfur gases. So it's it's kind of noxious. Um, and but and understanding those, you know, the balance of these partial of these little tiny trace gas co constituents uh, is important to understand. Again, sort of this balance of, of stuff that's going on. So figuring out and these are all. And notice the error bars on some of these things. They're 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 pretty pretty big. Even the second largest constituent of the atmosphere. That's like a that's like a um, uh, 30, 40 percent error bar uh, on nitrogen. We just don't. There's so much we don't know. As we get to the lower atmosphere, do we have weird stratifications of these kinds of things? Uh, and how does that affect potentially the surface atmosphere chemistry that we want to see? And we just don't know. I mean, so getting that stuff in multiple places again uh, is is part of the challenge. Um, in the clouds themselves, we, there has been recent, uh, recent and not so recent speculation about could there have been uh, or could there still be life in the clouds of Venus? Some of the early work is, again, this is, this is uh, uh, decades old the speculation, but, some, but also there's much more recent speculation about the possible habitability of the Venus clouds or the cloud environment for microbes, for ecosystems. Um, and uh, yeah, so cloud, cloud cities probably not, but um, uh, uh, and but there are there is potentially a habitability zone in the Venus atmosphere, and we can constrain that by knowing about um, the uh, about the habitability of Earth's atmosphere. So so we have a potential habitable range in in Venus's atmosphere that we've sort of constrained by by what we have seen of uh, of different uh, um, organisms that don't live full time in the Earth's atmosphere, but can survive in the Earth's atmosphere at these levels. Um, so if we want to grab pieces of the surface, if we want to you know, study the surface in situ, we have to arrive and potentially escape the heat. And doing that, act, you know, getting down to the surface is, uh, um, is not, it's not instantaneous. It's, it's an elevator ride into hell. And if we want to do it in both directions, it takes at least twice as long. So fast ascents to the surface take on the order of an hour, and you're getting hotter and higher pressure every minute of that hour. And if you want to ascend out of it, you start at the worst, and you have to get, you know, you have to survive to get better. So, you know, taking a round trip of an hour plus two hours means that even your sampler has to survive around the same amount of time in this kind of environment that the Soviet landers had to survive to take their two pictures and do their quick analyses before they fried uh, back in the 80s and 70s. Um, so the time above 200 to 300 degrees Celsius on the order of an hour, it may be unavoidable even if we want to bring things to the lab. Uh, so that's, you know, that is one of the huge challenges of, uh, that we'll be facing. Um, so, and also sort of where, I mean, we have, and we're talking about, you know, we talk about the, the, the 465 or so and 95 bar uh, mean uh, um, uh, sort of pressure and temperature of Venus, but the upper elevations, you know, they're much cooler, they're lower pressure, but they're really, really difficult to land on. And the lower uh, areas, they're hotter, they're denser, so uh, potentially even more of a challenge. Um, so, and, and we have to think about if we want to do, if we want to even even touch temporarily the surface and grab something, how do we do it? What are we going to grab? The few images we have of the surface show rocks, they show boulders, they show dust, they show cobbles, they show platy, uh, uh, volcanic-like surfaces. And this is some of the smoothest, simplest material uh, areas that we think we we might encounter. Uh, and you know, these some of these uh, boulders and stuff—they're 10, 20 centimeters on the side. 
and what if they're bigger? What if you land or are trying to grab something in an area where you're talking boulders that are a meter in size? Um, or what if you're in an area that where there's very little, you know, dust or dirt for you to sample? Do you have to bore in and grab, you know, slabs of basalt and chip it out? And, and you know, these are big questions. So, you know, uh, and so, so this was uh, on the top is Venera 9, uh, on the bottom is Venera 13, and now Venera 13 and 14. Um, you know, this kind of surface um, is what, we, and these are the, these are sort of plays units on the surface. But when we go to things like uh, 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 rift zones or tessera or uh, volcanic flow fronts, it could look like Hawaiian a'a, uh -uh. it could look like cliffs, it could look like uh, um, a whole, you know, lots of different uh, 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 territories. It could look like the Himalayas. We might be trying to sample materials from slopes that are challenging to landers. So, um, and, you know, Venus has a lot of these things in our, in, that, are, that are interesting, the tessera, the plains, um, the craters themselves, which might be excavating parts of the interior that we want to, and that we want to get pieces of. Um, so Venus is an extraordinarily challenging environment. Ooh, and I'm running out of time. So I'm going to uh, quickly, uh, again, here's our stratigraphy. We have planes, we have tessera, we have rifts and volcanoes. And we have a variety of materials, even in the few analysis that we've gotten. Um, we, uh, we have different materials that, uh, that the Soviet landers uh, um, found. And so there's a variety on the surface, even in similar looking terrains. Um, and, and these speak to the evolution of the, of the surface and the interior. And we need to, uh, we want to grab, we want to understand many of these locations. Um, and, and finally, this is sort of the last piece of science. This is some of the stuff that we've been able to do, emulate in the laboratory, how a fresh material on the surface might in fact be affected by the atmosphere. When we get to the surface, do we want, are we gonna grab only something that's been really chewed up and, and modified by the atmosphere? Or can we find something that's relatively pristine and a real symbol of what, a real representation of what's on the inside? So these are all some of the big questions that we have and, uh, and we'll be, and be trying to get at. So, you know, the, in the end, you know, the, these are, this is a short and incomplete list of the true, both challenges and benefits, right? We have exposure time on the surface. We have exposure time of our materials. We have sampling variety across the surface. We have, uh, how do we, if we get samples, how do we rendezvous back with our laboratory? We have selection of the samples. We have monitoring of systems of planetary systems of uh, activity. And we have complex analysis that we want to, uh, that we want to uh, perform. So, um, so that's that's uh, the end of my introduction. And the next talks you, you'll see uh, coming up uh, will deal with some of the specifics of how we uh, want to do, how we hope to do, what we want to do, and what our current limitations and, uh, and next directions are.